Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the talk. I'm Jingming Guo, a software engineer of Airbnb. I work in cloud infra team. I'm currently focusing on building a high performance and reliable system for Airbnb internal DNS. Previously in AWS, I worked on the block storage platform. I love my current job as it motivates me every day to learn, think, and explore something new. Outside of work, I enjoy baking, hiking, skiing, and growing tomatoes and sunflowers in my yard. Today, I'm going to talk about the DNS in Kubernetes and share about the Airbnb's Kubernetes DNS use cases and solutions. Here is our agenda today. First, I will talk about the DNS functionality inside Kubernetes. Then, I'm going to share how CoreDNS works as a cluster DNS server, some takeaways of integration of CoreDNS in Airbnb's Kubernetes infrastructure. Also share some major DNS use cases in Airbnb and our solutions. Finally, I'm going to talk about some multi-cluster DNS explorations. Before I start, let me ask a question. How many of you have had to deal with or troubleshoot DNS issues in Kubernetes and found it confusing? Wow, I see so many hands. Thank you. Then today, we are going to break it down. By the end of the talk, we will have a better understanding of Kubernetes DNS. So let's have a look together of how a DNS request is generally resolved in the Kubernetes cluster. The DNS request is sent out by the application running in Kubernetes pod. The resolver is the first step of DNS lookup. Here, the resolver refers to the DNS resolver library that runs in the system to provide core functionalities for resolving domain names into IP addresses. The actual resolver library usage can be various depending on the programming language and operating system. Example in Go, there are two types of resolvers. One is a CTO resolver that calls standard C library glibc, and the other is pure Go DNS resolver. The resolver consumes the DNS configuration on the pod, which is specified in the resolve.conf file. The DNS configuration file contains the name server IP that the resolver will send the query to. If we are using a cluster DNS server, this name server IP should be the cluster IP of the cluster DNS service. Example, the service is called kubeDNS with cluster IP 10.32.0.10. That resolver will send the traffic to this IP. After the request reaches kubeDNS service, kubeProxy will route the traffic to cluster DNS server pod if your Kube proxy runs in IP table mode, that the traffic will be routed via IP table rules. Here, the cluster DNS server is Core DNS. Core DNS is a flexible, extensible DNS server that is currently used as a default Kubernetes cluster DNS. When Core DNS runs as a cluster DNS server, it interacts with the Kube API server as a asynchronously to resolve the Kubernetes-defined service and pod DNS. For the other domain record that are not defined in Kubernetes cluster can be forwarded to upstream DNS server, example, Route 53. Route 53 as a recursive DNS server can resolve public domain names. We just mentioned that the resolve can file holds the pod DNS configuration. Now let's have a look, closer look at how this configuration affects DNS queries. You're able to read the pod DNS configuration from slash etc slash resolve.conf path on your pod. Here is an example of the resolve.conf file. We can see it contains name server, search path, and options. The name server specified the DNS name server's IP address. The search field defines a list of search domains, and the option section allows modification to certain internal resolver settings. The commonly used option like n.timeout attempts 
N dots define the threshold for the number of dots which must appear in a name before an initial absolute query will be made. Timeout sets the amount of time the resolver will wait for a response from a remote name server before retrying the query via a different name server. A times sets the number of times the resolver will send a query to its name servers before giving up and returning an error to the calling application. This configuration might still seem confusing. Let's work through some examples. Here is a configuration, and let's configure www.airbnb.com. There are two dots in this record, which meets the n dot threshold that the query will be directly sent to the name server. And the DNS server used here is route 53, which can respond with the result. Great. Let's see another example of a PQDN resolution. What is our PQDN? PQDN represents partially qualified domain names, which means only a portion of the full domain name. In contract, FQDN stands for fully qualified domain names, which represent the complete domain names of an address. With the proper DNS configuration settings, both PQDN and FQDN can be resolved to the IPs successfully. Kubernetes defined the DNS record of service in format of service name dot namespace dot svc dot cluster domain, which can be resolved to the service cluster IP, which is a virtual IP within the range of a cluster service IP range. Example, service name is full, namespace is bar, and the cluster domain is a cluster dot local. The service PQDN is a full.bar, and the FQDN is full.bar.svc.cluster.local. The FQDN here is a record that can be resolved by the cluster DNS. With the proper DNS configurations, the PQDN can also be resolved. How does it work? Let's see this DNS configuration. In this example, n dot is one. Full dot bar record has one dot, meets the n dot threshold. Full dot bar record is directly sent to DNS server, but cluster DNS server can't resolve it. So return nx domain represents the domain name does not exist. This result is not returned to the client yet, as the configuration contains a search domain list. The resolver will append each search domain and uh, send the request to the name server in sequence. Full.bar append the first search domain here, construct the record as full.bar.bar.svc.cluster.local and send a request to the name server. Unfortunately, this is still not the correct record and got another NX domain here. Don't give up, keep trying. Okay, append next search domain. And the record is constructed as full.bar.svc.cluster.local. Nice. This is a record. We can get the correct response, and this result will be returned to the client. Interesting story is n.5 is a Kubernetes cluster first DNS policy default DNS option settings, which makes their domain name to append all the search domains in the search path before finally sending out the query as it is. Client is still able to get the correct response, but client side DNS request latency is not optimized. Not good. Then you may ask, can I customize these configurations? Yes, there are ways to customize pod DNS configurations. The pod DNS configuration can be customized with different settings. First is the Kubelet configuration. Kubelet contains logic to construct pod DNS configuration when creating a pod. Kubelet configuration can be used to customize the pod DNS configuration. Specific fields to use as a, first the cluster DNS is a list of IP addresses for cluster DNS server. If set, Kubelet will configure all container in the cluster to use these addresses as name server for a pod using cluster first DNS policy. 
Example in Airbnb, we configure it to the core DNS service cluster IP. Cluster domain is a DNS domain for this cluster. If set, Kubelet will configure all containers in the cluster to search this domain in addition to the basis container DNS configuration search domains of pod using cluster first DNS policy. ResolveConf is a resolver configuration file used as a basis for the pod DNS resolution configuration. This is a configuration used by pod using default DNS policy. You can set it to a path that is a mount on the node during node bootstrapping that contains the desired DNS configuration you want to customize to, which is also the way we use in Airbnb. Pod DNS policy is also a way to define pod DNS configurations. Kubelet contains logic to create pod config DNS configuration based on DNS policy. Kubernetes defines four DNS policies. Default is targeted to inherit configuration from the host or basis container DNS resolution configuration in Kubelet. Class first is a target to use cluster DNS server to resolve cluster domain DNS record. Note that default is not the default DNS policy. If a DNS policy is not specifically specified, then cluster first is used. Cluster first with a host net is for pod running with a host network should explicitly set the policy to use cluster DNS server. Now means all DNS settings are supposed to be provided using the DNS con config file in the pod spec. And yep, the DNS config file in the pod spec is the, uh, the another way to customize pod DNS configuration. It allows you to define all the pod DNS configurations. If we choose to customize pod DNS configuration, then it should accommodate the application's DNS use cases. Let's see an example here. In Airbnb, we have the use case that the application runs in service mesh and it needs to reach AWS services. Service mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer for facilitating service-to-service -service communication using a proxy. Application running service mesh can reach other applications using PQDN format defined of service name dot namespace and the full DNS record is a service name dot namespace dot mesh domain and this mesh DNS is stored in route 53. So we can define that the search list contains a search domain and the end dot set has two. Name server is route 53 the mesh PQDN only contains one dot that will always be appended, appended to the mesh domain first, then sent out a query to the name server, which is what we want. And the AWS services endpoint contains at least two dots. And the meet the threshold here will be directly sent out to the name server. So with this DNS configuration, both kind of DNS queries are optimized for achieving the functionality through a single DNS request. One notices to pay attention to the DNS configuration limit. glibc standard library DNS resolver removes the limit of a number of search domains and the characters of search paths since since v2.26. Kubernetes also extended its search domains and the search path limit since v1.28. Band utils contains the dig, host, and xlookup utilities for querying DNS still has a limit. So if you're using Kubernetes version higher than v1.28 and uses more than eight search domains in the search path, but use dig or host or nxlookup command, which is using band utils that have eight search domain limit, that the search domain larger than eight won't be used. Now everyone should have a decent understanding of pod DNS configurations. In the DNS request life cycle, cycle, we talked about core DNS can be used as a cluster DNS server to resolve Kubernetes-defined service and pod DNS. 
Let's have a deeper look at this part. How is CoreDNS used as a Kubernetes cluster DNS server? CoreDNS is a DNS server also forwarder written in Go that chains plugins. Each plugin performs a specific DNS function. CoreDNS provides a bunch of plugins which powers its functionalities and flexibilities. To make CoreDNS perform as a cluster DNS server, you need to enable and configure the Kubernetes plugin. Kubernetes plugin implements the Kubernetes DNS-based service discovery. It uses Kubernetes client API watch function to track the service and endpoint objects from Kube API server and construct their DNS record based on their Kubernetes-defined service and pod DNS format. It maintains a local cache of the watched objects. You can also enable other commonly used plugins as shown in the graph, like a Ready plugin serves a Ready endpoint requires for readiness probe. Health plugin serves a health endpoint required for liveness probe. Promises plugin serves a metrics endpoint required for export metrics. Log plugin enables query logging. Cache plugin enables a server side front end cache. And forward plugin is for facilitating proxy DS requests to upstream resolvers. CoreDNS also supports customized plugin when you can write a plugin for achieving your specific DNS functionality. Note that the plugin's order is very important. The order is defined in the CoreDNS code, plugin.cfg file. If you develop a custom plugin, you also need to properly insert it into the right position of the plugin's chain. Each plugin can be configured to handle different domain or zone requests. CoreDNS uses a core file stored in config map for configurations. In the core file, you can configure cluster.local domains requests to be handled by Kubernetes plugin, and all the other domains requests be handled by forward plugin, which forwards the DNS request to an upstream DNS server. Here is an example core file. In the core file, you can also apply other useful configurations like enable query logging for error response queries, set a front-end cache TTL, enable automatic reload when coding core file change, et cetera. CoreDNS as a cluster DNS server can resolve Kubernetes-defined DNS for services and pods record as shown in the graph. These records are used for Kubernetes service discovery, which is widely adopted in various Kubernetes services and projects. By March 2024, Airbnb have been fully integrated with CoreDNS in our Kubernetes platform. It's a successful integration and a noticeable for its operational excellence and thoroughness. Here are some takeaways I'd like to share that probably can help folks who are going to migrate to use CoreDNS. First is to evaluate the function and the performance before adoption. In our evaluation, we found that we can get around 70% performance improvement of average DNS request latency, which elevates our confidence of integrating CoreDNS into our platform. You, the second is uh, using the same DNS service during migration. When a Kubernetes cluster is bootstrapped, we can easily reserve an IP for cluster DNS service. But creating a new service in the cluster with another IP and changing the pod DNS configuration to use the new name server IP are tons of work. A Kubernetes service can select a pod it is supposed to abstract through a label selector. So we can use the same DNS service during migration. Example, the previous service is created as a kubeDNS. We can create a new deployment with a pod spec selector of the same kubeDNS service. 
In this way, we don't need to create a new Kubernetes service or change pod DNS configuration. It saves us lots of eff migration effort and can also gradually shift the DNS traffic in the cluster, which we want to control the blast radius. The other takeaway is uh, making sure to set appropriate memory and CPU requests for the core DNS container. When core DNS serves as a cluster DNS server, its memory usage scales with the number of services and endpoints due to the local cache from the Kubernetes plugin. All pods have the same local cache size, which doesn't automatically scale with HPA aka horizontal pod autoscaler. In our evaluation, we found core DNS performance is a CPU driven. Enabling HPA based on CPU usage is beneficial. Now we have a comprehensive understanding of DNS request within the Kubernetes cluster. Next, I would like to share some multi-cluster DNS use cases we have in Airbnb and how we set up the DNS architecture to fulfill the use cases we have. One use case I want to share is service-to-service -service communication in service mesh. In previous slides, we mentioned a bit about service mesh. Record here. Service Mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer for facilitating service-to-service -service communication between services or microservices using a proxy. Istio is an open source service mesh that helps organizations run distributed microservices-based applications anywhere. In Airbnb, we are using Istio Service Mesh. Our service mesh architecture is using a dedicated mesh management cluster for Istio control plane and applications running other multiple workload clusters. Istio proxy sidecar is injected for all applications running service mesh as an Istio data plane. Istio control plane will watch all the cluster's endpoints and merge endpoints in the same namespace together. These endpoints information will be pushed to the Istio proxy sidecars for traffic routing. Applications running in workload clusters can communicate with each other through PQDN format. To achieve it, we create a service object in mesh management cluster using the same namespace of applications pod. This guarantees each application running mesh have a unique IP. This service DNS record is synced to Route 53 through external DNS service. External DNS service is targeted for synchronizing exposed Kubernetes service with DNS providers. Applications running workload clusters can resolve DNS through Route 53. I think you all know how to configure DNS configuration to allow resolver resolve DNS with PQDN format. After getting this service IP, the rest of the traffic route to the target endpoint will be handled by Istio proxy. Another use case I want to show here is a multi-cluster direct pod addressing. In distributed database, running on the Kubernetes cluster, stateful set is important for data partition and synchronization. Stateful set pod has a predictable DNS name. Each pod in a stateful set derives its host name from the name of stateful set and the ordinal of the pod. Direct pod addressing ensures that database queries can reach the target data partition and cross-cluster replicas can sync the data with each other. To achieve multi-cluster stateful set direct pod addressing, we can also leverage external DNS with Route 53. In each cluster, the pod IPs are synced to Route 53 with a different domain name 
and the application can reach the target pod by querying the pod DNS with target domain from Route 53. Pretty easy, right? But there are also challenges. You may notice that we are heavily using cloud DNS services like Route 53. There are some limitations we might, like uh, Route 53 throttling. Route 53 API have five requests per second per AWS account limit, which is a hard limit that impacts Route 53 managed DNS record update. And AWS has 1,024 packets per second per elastic network interface limit, which is also a hard limit that can impact the DNS queries. There are some other approaches we are exploring around. Kubernetes provides multi-cluster service API, and CoreDNS have a multi-cluster plugin that supports Kubernetes multi-cluster DNS resolution. It introduces cluster set terminology, a placeholder name for a group of clusters with a high degree of mutual trust and shared ownership that share services amongst themselves and is using a multi-cluster service controller that syncs service across clusters and makes them available for multi-cluster service discovery and connectivity. As we're using Istio Service Mesh inside the Airbnb, Istio DNS sidecar also support multi-cluster DNS request resolution within the mesh. When proxying DNS, all DNS requests from an application will be redirected to the sidecar, which stores a local mapping of domain names to IP addresses. But the limitation is it's only applied to the applications run with the Istio proxy sidecar. And welcome to discuss if you're using multi-cluster DNS resolution in your system and we'd like to get more ideas and takeaways from the community. This concludes today's talk. Welcome to scan the QR code to give me feedback and we have several minutes for the Q&A. Are there any questions? Thank you. For core DNS, how does it support cache and validation as, as records change? You're asking uh, how core DNS cache validation change? Yeah, or for cache invalidation. So as the record changes, where does that invalidation come in? Yeah, it's a, for if you're using the front end cache of core DNS, there you need to set the TTL of the record. That is uh, the time you set. If that expires the TTL, then it is invalid. Okay, thank you. Are there any qu other questions? Yeah. Is it possible to use NS update to dynamically update DNS zones with core DNS? Uh, dynamic update core DNS using? NS update. Sorry, could you say it again? NS update? NS update. This is a, like if this, uh, I, I heard you're asking about the NX update, which is our. Yeah, it's RFC, I forget which one it is. It's what Bind9 uses for dynamic updates. It would be used, we have a use case where it could potentially be useful for internal zones for testing purposes. So that is a, if you find it uh, for coding as that plugin, if you support that functionality, that will be uh, able to support. Because uh, there are a bunch of Airbnb, uh, uh, coding as plugins that you can explore around the, of it. So you may refer to the uh, specific plugin manual that can find the uh, answer there. Thank you. I have a question here. Uh, so in terms of uh, no local cache DNS, uh, have you explored that option? So what are, what are the challenges you face with local cache DNS versus the core DNS itself? 
Node cache DNS, right? Node yeah. local cache DNS. Yeah, node local cache DNS, the other, the other DNS cache layer, you can apply it on the, uh, on, on the node. That is uh, runs as a daemon set, which is also runs a Kubernetes, uh, sorry, a core DNS service as a daemon set in the node. That is uh, depends on, that is depends on your, like uh, mm, the service requires, like how uh, performance latency you want to have. It uh, definitely can improve the DNS request uh, performance, but you may evaluate if your system is really need there or this is uh, doesn't really uh, need it because that introduces additional part on each node and introduce additional cost. So if you use node local um, cache that is request, first come to the node local cache, then you can configure this node local cache DNS request to reach core DNS. So in Airbnb, have you tried it and you found any challenging with that and you didn't like it, that pattern? Uh, we're still evaluate about that part. This is our, like in progressing. Uh, okay, last question. Okay, uh, the question is more about uh, how did you do the puff testing about the core DNS versus the DNS core? Uh, did you use like a cache invalidate when you're doing the testing or how are you assuring that the performance is improved? Sorry, could you speak louder? Yeah, uh, can, can you explain a little bit more about how, do, how does your puff test was running and uh, how do you evaluate it that core DNS is a problem and how, how much efficiency you improved on all of that? Because in general, you, your client will be caching your IP, resolved IP, right? So did you have any client that will invalidate the, or is it gonna establish new resolution whenever you make a new call and how did you do that? Yeah, when you want to evaluate, that is uh, related with uh, how you are going, your uh, application's use case, and how you want to evaluate based on um, the specific use case you want to evaluate. Example, if you don't want to evaluate the cache, you can just uh, disable it. So that is a uh, fully just evaluate, which is uh, without cache. But if your, you see the cache size is enough to, um, to hold your like DNS record in the cluster, which means most of the DNS record will be cached. In that case, you can also enable the cache, evaluate with the cache enabled. So that is based on like your use case and your DNS patterns. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone. If there <laughs> thanks everyone. So in the end, we invite you to explore career opportunities with Airbnb. Visit careers.airbnb.com and we look forward to welcoming you to our team. Thanks everyone.